Chair King, members of the Board of Trustees, honored guests, distinguished faculty, officers, family, and friends. On the occasion of the 167th of the Cooper Union for the Advancement of Science and Art, it is my great honor and privilege as president to welcome you to this historic Great Hall. And now it is my great honor to present the members of the class of 2020s and rise and join me in applauding this graduating class for their exceptional work and accomplishments. remain standing for the singing of the national anthem. We will be led by Kevin Dai, Purna Dutta, Olivia Kim, Yi Ji Kim, Jin and student trustee Shirley Yam. Thank you all. Please be seated. Malcolm King, Chair of the Board of Trustees, will offer a greeting. Good morning. Congratulations to the class of 2022 and a warm welcome to your families and your friends. Every year, we invite a local religious leader to offer the invocation recognizing that Cooper Union comprises a diverse community and a population of various backgrounds, we rotate through religious communities. In recognition and support of our neighbors here in the East Village, Little Ukraine, this year's invocation will be delivered by Bishop Paul Hamnitsky, who is eparch of the Stamford Eparchy of the Ukrainian Greek Church Please stand for the invocation and join me in welcoming Bishop Haminsky.
Before we begin our prayer, I would like to express, on behalf of the Ukrainian American community living here in the East Village and gathered around the spiritual heart of our community, St. George's Ukrainian Catholic Church, located just on the next block, for those of you who need more precise orientation, right across the street from McSorley's Pub. <laughs> I want to express our, uh, my sincere and heartfelt thanks for the prayers, the emotional support and material aid that has been directed from you to us, through our community, to the suffering nation of Ukraine since the beginning of the bloody war three months ago. This outpouring has been truly overwhelming for all of us and greatly appreciated. And we are all very, very grateful for having you, in you, such good friends and neighbors. But today we have come together, and this in itself is significant. We have come together for the first time since the pandemic prevented us from doing so. It, seemed, it seems like eons ago to celebrate Commencement Day at Cooper Union. And indeed, I think we can all say how good it is to be here. We thank, we thank God for allowing us to experience the hard but perhaps necessary lesson that we have learned over the course of the last couple of years of this imposed isolation, that we human beings are indeed incomplete without each other. We need to see each other to stand with each other, to learn together, to walk together, hand in hand, to touch each other, flesh and blood, and to treasure each other's gifts. So we thank you, Lord, for this day, for those with whom we share it, for the gift of the Cooper Union, for its founder and benefactors, for its faculty and staff, and for all those whose vision over the decades has shaped this institution to what it is today. Thank you, Lord, today for our families, friends and neighbors, and all who share this journey of learning with us. Thank you for the wisdom to recognize our gifts and to serve you and each other with gratitude. Bless, O oh Lord, the Cooper Union class of 2022 and guide them as they continue to pursue their dreams and perhaps ways known as yet only to you. Instill in them the courage to move beyond their fears and doubts. Give them generous and loving hearts with the capacity to care for others and to respect the diversity of humankind. Help them to realize that true success in life is born of meaningful relationships. Give them the desire and determination to build a society free of violence of every kind we see in Ukraine and in Texas today and in a thousand other places. And give them the determination to build a community that embraces peace and peace and peace. Through your gracious spirit, O oh Lord, we ask you today, you bless the class of 2022 with patience as they explore new horizons. Bless them with humility in the face of success and abundance that will come to them, hopefully. Bless them with compassion for the poor, the sick, the suffering, the disadvantaged. Bless them with generosity in the midst of the challenges to come. Bless, bless them with love for family, friends, and mentors who have supported them through this journey. And bless all of us here today as we share in the joy of their accomplishments and in their hopes for the future. This we ask of you, O God, in your generosity and loving kindness. Amen. Thank you, Bishop Kominsky. Please be seated. Good morning. Thank you. Good morning. Welcome once again to the Great Hall. It is really and truly my honor and privilege to be here in celebration of the Cooper Union Class of 2022. I am overjoyed to be back on this stage all together, all together, all historic 
space on commencement day. This is a momentous occasion in any year, but even more so in this one, as all of you graduates, friends, and family have found your way through an extraordinary time to this moment to commemorate all that you have worked for and achieved in your great time at the Cooper Union. I want to thank Bishop Komnitsky for his beautiful invocation. Cooper has the good fortune of being part of a community here in the East Village that for decades has been known as Little Ukraine. Since the news of Russia's invasion of Ukraine, our hearts have been with our neighbors especially. Thank you, Bishop, for being here. The idea of a people fighting against injustice and oppression in search of peace, of giving everything to protect and shape their way of life, those are subjects that have often been addressed in this very room. Of course, it began with Abraham Lincoln and his seminal Right Makes Might address here in 1860 at a time when this nation was moving ever closer to civil war. Fast forward nearly 100 years, and a man named Ralph Bunch, who would become the first African American to be awarded the Nobel Peace Prize, spoke here about his work at the United Nations. He introduced his Great Hall talk by saying, and I quote, I believe that the peoples of the world, all the peoples of the world, long for peace above everything else. Certainly those words are as true in 2022 as they were when Mr. Bunch spoke them in 1949. And while we have much to overcome in their pursuit, I am heartened of the students who walk this same stage on commencement day. You represent the kind of potential that contributes the good, the good to the world that we so desperately need. On this commencement day, we are reminded how gatherings such as this are something that perhaps we once took for granted. Now they are all too precious, and it's required more than the, more than the, more than planning and coordination to give this graduating class an in-person celebration worthy of their accomplishments. And so I want to express my deepest thanks to our commencement committee, our health and safety, health and safety, health and incredible facilities and security teams, and everyone involved in making this special day possible. Day possible. Day. <laughs> Graduates, you came to Cooper as a group of already exceptional students. And over these last several years, you pushed yourself in new ways, and you deepened passionate commitments to your disciplines through the work that you created, the problems you solved, the craft and skills you refined and applied, and the ideas you explored. Your perseverance, resilience, and sheer desire have carried you to this day, and you deserve to relish every single moment of it. You are at the center of this commencement celebration, to be sure. Um, today, however, is also a time for recognizing the community around you, family, friends, peers, and mentors who were with you along your Cooper journey. To those of you who supported these students through the many ups and downs of a college experience that certainly included more disruptions and change than any of us could have anticipated, we thank you. You encouraged and consoled them when they needed it most, supported them when the world seemed to shut down, and when it gradually reopened. You gave them confidence in themselves and guided them to become the thoughtful, creative, independent people seated here with us. Today, we celebrate you too. We also celebrate and honor those who hold a special place in our graduates' lives but weren't able to be here today. For many, the pandemic remains a concern, understandably. For others, obstacles to travel remain, and still, other lives were not long enough to see this day. Whatever the reason, they are in our hearts and our thoughts, and they are with us in spirit. I want to also celebrate our faculty and staff who have shared you, shared you, shared you along the way for the last several years. They are some of the most accomplished in their fields, and I have already heard from many of them what an honor it has been to be part of your Cooper experience, 
to have witnessed and supported your growth, your curiosity, your persistence, your discoveries, your sorrows, and your joys. The challenge, the challenge have called on them to do their work in new ways too, to stretch themselves to meet new demands so that your development could continue here in full force. Today, we celebrate them and we thank them for their part in your Cooper Union endeavors. As I look around and see you, our graduates, adorned in cap and gown, I think not only of the cumulative achievements that commencement symbolizes, but also of the personal growth that I have witnessed in you along the way in your individual pursuits as budding architects, artists, and engineers. And in your contributions to causes larger than yourselves. It has afforded me a small glimpse into the promise and potential that the future holds for you and the potential that you hold for our shared future. You are about to enter a world that is profoundly different than the one you, you knew when you first arrived here at Cooper. In a relatively short span of time, so much has changed. There have been upheavals unprecedented in our lifetimes, but also causes for hope. Vaccines were developed and distributed with incredible speed. Where injustices occurred, influential movements formed. In many ways, the city shut down, but New Yorkers found creative ways of coming together. And our society kept moving forward. Progress happened. Juneteenth became a federal holiday. The US women's soccer team won the World Cup and their fight for equal pay. NASA's Perseverance rover set back stunning photographs from the graphs from the graphs. I think we should applaud a win for equal pay. <laughs> you witnessed forward movement while navigating the urgent and complex issues still confronting us. Ongoing crises of public health, systemic racial injustices, deep conflict overseas, widening inequality, and climate breakdown and all of it at a time of growing division and doubt about the welfare of our democracy. Just yesterday in Uvalde, Texas, and before that in Buffalo, New York, and in Laguna Woods, California, we were again shaken, devastated by gun violence and the kind of hateful extremism that continues to tear at the fabric of our society. The leak of a Supreme Court opinion rattled our sense of security in our judicial process and threatened the safety and autonomy of women across the country. It can be tempting to doubt the potential of your own individual impact against the enormity of the larger societal problems we face. But as Cooper graduates, you are ready. You are well prepared to define your path forward, to make your mark in the way that you choose. You have developed a well of resilience. You learned to see your ideas, actions, and practices as a great source of power for reshaping and responding to the world's challenges. The pandemic taught us never to take the status quo for granted, that a healthy society requires ongoing effort, proactive care. Those commitments are at the heart of the kind of education Peter Cooper envisioned for this institution when he founded it, an education that activates and nurtures civic life. In the work that you've undertaken as a student, you discovered the value of becoming a citizen of the world, of applying your intellect and your skill to prepare a brighter future for yourself and for our society. As you now prepare for the next chapter, I want to encourage you to lean on the connection and shared purpose that you built here. It will guide you forward. One thing that became clear when we returned to campus at the start of this academic year is how much care you have for one another. I've been so personally moved by the warmth that you've shown toward each other. It speaks to a renewed sense of the importance of human connection. Small actions that bind us together that we once took for granted are now a critical part of everyday habits. The ability to see one another in person, to share space, to make eye contact as a piece of cloth covered the rest of our faces, to say hello 
while passing in the hallway and to check in and ask how others are doing. I imagine many of you experienced difficult or stressful moments that were made easier to bear thanks to the simple kindness of a friend, classmate, faculty, or staff member. These may seem like small things, but the overall feeling of support and solidarity that can grow from them is so vital in how we relate to one another. The question now becomes, how do you take this forward? How do you foster and support that connectedness as a way of working on the world? Earlier this semester, we hosted Ro Khanna, a member of Congress from Silicon Valley, for a Great Hall conversation about the digital divide in the United States and the inequalities surrounding the tech industry. One of the points he made was, that, uh, was about the ways that social media and the internet often trap us in cynicism. We feel that the only power we have as citizens is to dash off a hasty retort or retweet opinions that gain viral ground. One part of the solution, as he put it, is to embrace, to embrace, to embrace like this great hall, which provides an open forum for civic conversation. But he also suggested the need to reimagine what a productive digital public sphere might look like. You are the very people who can help shape that. Whatever your field of study, solving the problem of repairing connections, of closing divides, of encouraging substantive conversation, and of seeking out truth together. All of these are central to sustaining our democracy and a healthy society. They are some of the most important tasks for your generation because so much else depends on it. You give me hope precisely because you recognize that this is a defining moment in our society. In the wake of injustices, national tragedy, global public health crises, and calls for action, it is so often students and young people who organize, rally, and voice in the clearest terms what must be done. The voices of your generation are loud and they are clear because you are passionate and you are connected. What these last few years have taught us is that we must not and cannot live in our own silos or expect change to come from somewhere else. It starts with the connections we nurture, person to person, the ability to see ourselves as part of a greater world around us, and a commitment to making positive change for the benefit of others. You have no doubt seen these traits that I'm describing best exemplified in a group of people who are the living embodiment of the Cooper Union's mission, our alumni. Some of those alumni you may have already met in your course of studies. Perhaps they served as mentors and teachers, or maybe they opened the door to opportunities or internships. They may have donated time, materials, or funding to support you in your work. As members of the class of 2022, you now join that extended alumni family and take your place among a group of individuals who represent the strength of a Cooper education. Individuals who look to pay it forward, whether to the students coming behind them or to their broader communities. You may see in them the influence and impact that you strive to have in your own work, and they in turn may look to you for inspiration. They will look to you as peers, collaborators, partners, and allies. I urge you to be an active part of that community. Build on the connections that began here. They have the capacity to do so much for you and for our community at large. Shortly, you will walk across this historic stage and join the ranks of graduates who are together the stewards of Peter Cooper's vision. As I mentioned at the outset of my remarks, not only are you walking in the footsteps of the Cooper graduates who have come before you across this stage, you are also surrounded so surround, so by the voices of all who have sought out the Cooper Union and the Great Hall for more than 160 years as a place of organizing and influencing, for informing and calling others to action, for making New York City and the nation a more perfect union. I know you will take that vision with you wherever you go as principled, passionate advocates for the great possibilities you see for this world. I wish you all the very best. You are a permanent member of the Cooper Union family, and I want you to know that you will always have a home base here at Cooper. This is a community that extends from here in the East Village around the globe, no matter where you are. What a proud day this is on Cooper Square. Congratulations, class of 2022.
welcome Nada Ayad and Tony Torres to present the Student Awards. Good morning. Each year, the faculty and deans recognize some of the extraordinary, extraordinary, extraordinary graduates in each of the three professional schools with awards made possible by generous alumni and friends. On behalf of my colleagues, it is my pleasure to thank these benefactors for recognizing the tremendous potential of our students by creating the student prizes and awards listed in the program. The first award is the Tony and David Yarnell Merritt Award of Excellence in Architecture, which goes to Annabella Grace Chen and Sydney Huskolds Lynette of the Irwin Tiananmen School of Architecture. <laughs> Annabella and Sydney, please come up for your awards if you're here. Congratulations. The Irma Justino Weiss Award for Exceptional Creative Potential in Architecture or Art, GOAT, GOAT, friend of the School of Art. Congratulations. The Jack and Natasha Gelman Foundation Award in Art goes to Vildriana Maria de Jesus Paulino of the School of Art. The David and Tony Arnell Merritt Award of Excellence in Art goes to Isabel Margaret Jerome of the School of Art. An architecture commencement prize goes to Kevin Ronald Chow and Ozzy Nam of the Irwin Shannon School of Architecture. Prize for Academic Achievement and Leadership in Engineering goes to Jonathan Lamb of the Albert Nurkin School of Engineering. Congratulations. The Martin J. Waters Memorial Award of Excellence in Art goes to Isabel Margaret Jerome of the School of Art and Sanjana Lahiri of the Irwin S. Janin School of Architecture.
morning, everybody. Welcome, and really glad to see everybody here in person today. Uh, to select the student who will speak on behalf of the graduating class at commencement, the Office of Student Affairs sponsors a senior speech contest, judged by a jury of invited faculty, students, and administrators. Julia Buckley of the Albert Nurkin School of Engineering is the winner of this year's competition. Assembled guests, the 2022 senior class speaker, Julia Buckley. Julia, please come up. <laughs> everyone good morning <laughs> I'm sure my fellows graduating students are super excited to be here today but as friends mentors parents and guardians I can imagine you all are so happy seeing your loved ones up here it's been a long time coming and you probably walked in telling your graduate that you were so proud of them but I was talking to a friend from high school last month about graduation and she said girl Based on the stories you've been telling me, it's a miracle you all are graduating. <laughs> Which is kind of a fair point. I mean, I've seen my fair share of chaos in life, but I have never seen so many things go wrong in any single place like it does at Cooper, especially for the class of 22. <laughs> First, the building flooded. And not puddle on the floor flooding, I mean 30,000 gallons of water, no school for a week, big blue kiddie pool serving as the seventh floor's last hope type of flooding. And just as the building was getting back to itself, bam, COVID. Two years away from our friends and professors confined to our homes. No one had their cameras on. Most of the, our professors today are gonna hear our names read and think, so that's what she looks like. <laughs> there is never any drinking water. The elevators always seem to be broken when we have class. And I've had professors quit three days before classes were supposed to start. In fact, at this point, I think our class should get a superlative. Most inconvenienced. <laughs> but to bring things back to my friend's original statement, where she thought it's a miracle that we're graduating, I don't completely agree. Mainly because when it comes to Cooper students, I don't believe in miracles. A miracle is inexplicable. It's when something is so improbable that it must be a coincidence or the product of divine intervention. But that's just not true, because it's not the Cooper way. I have never seen a group of people with such passion for their work. Cooper students are strong, hardworking, and dedicated. There's a running joke that you'll meet an architect at orientation and not see them again until graduation, which, yes, is true. But because they spent countless hours making sure their work was up to the high standard that they could be proud of. All of the artists dedicated so much time to making your vision a reality. It's so impressive being able to use art to tell stories, convey deep emotions, and make powerful statements. And I've had the honor of working with so many inspiring engineers. In my freshman year on the motorsports team, I watched them organize work shifts five days straight so we could test our car before leaving for the competition. And there is nothing better than watching the passion on someone's face when they talk about a project they're working on, to know they gave it their all and genuinely loved it. As a class, we have all gone through so much together and come out on the other side stronger, because that's the Cooper way. Sometimes we have ideas, changes that we want to make or movements that we want to bring to Cooper. And sometimes those in charge doubt it and say no, because they can't see the solutions that we can. But instead of seeing this as a wall, Cooper students find support from each other and make that vision happen anyways. We stand up and fight to affect the change we want to see because no is not an answer. We didn't quit when the building closed. And when the elevators didn't come, we climbed the stairs. To say everything we've done is a miracle is to take away the power we hold in our voices, accomplishments, our knowledge, it doesn't describe how much each and every one of you have succeeded despite the challenges. So own it up, shout it from the rooftops, talk about your projects and buildings and robots and sculptures. Don't let anyone, especially not yourself, take your power or diminish your achievements. Cooper students tend to downplay themselves. I was talking to an architect at Admitted Students Day and I said something along the lines of, I have no idea what I'm doing. And she looked at me and she said, you build a whole rice car 
that's a lie, girl. I know the truth. And that made me think, because you know what? As a female minority engineer with too much ADHD, I found myself building engines, designing electric powertrains, and receiving an offer for my dream job as an engine controls engineer at Koningsegg Automotive in Sweden. And that's really cool. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and that's really, really cool. But I don't necessarily give myself credit. Because at the end of the day, I still feel just as confused as I was when I started. Talking to graduated students, something that often comes up is the thought that they still don't know anything. Which is a lie, but not totally incorrect. Each year felt equally difficult, but not because the course load was the same but because each year we learned to handle more and became stronger individuals. And with learning more about the world, you realize how much there is still left to learn. And I genuinely hope you all continue to understand that, because this is what drives innovation and passion. The world isn't built by those who have every answer. If that was true, it would be perfect. Instead, it's built by those who strive to do better, to know that there's more out there, and have the courage to reach for higher limits despite the hurdles. So in this next chapter of our lives, I really hope you all keep working the Cooper way. And when you inevitably face another hardship, remember, you have been through worse. The past four years have been conveniently inconvenient, and I think that's okay. It actually might have been the tool that shaped us into the powerful and powerful and powerful way. The world needs us to be, needs us to be, needs us to stand down from a problem, to keep fighting, to accomplish your goals. Continue to be the movers and shakers you are. and Make the world into the image you envision. Leave this hall proud, take your diploma, and recognize every victory and triumph from the last triumph from the last triumph. This class of 2022, you deserve it. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Julia. It is a long-standing tradition at Cooper Union to honor distinguished alumni who have made important contributions to their respective professions and to society. The presidential citation recognizes creativity, achievement, and outstanding citizenship, and the recipients offer paragons of excellence for today's graduates as they embark on their own career paths. Student trustee Shirley Yan will join me in presenting the presidential citation. This year's Presidential Citation in Architecture goes to Anthony Titus, a graduate of the class of 1998 who received a 2022 Arts and Letters Award in Architecture from the American Academy of Arts and Letters earlier this month. Will Anthony Titus please come forward? For for contributions to the fields of architecture and art as the founder of Anthony Titus Studio where the relationship between physical and representational space are continually explored. For widely exhibiting his work and expanding his practice through writing essays for myriad art publications, for bringing his insight, his insight, his in union classroom as a professor of architectonics, and for the honor he has brought to the Cooper Union. The Presidential Citation in Art is awarded to Fireli Baez, class of 2004. Will Fireli Baez please come forward? <laughs> For contributions to the field of art through her drawings, paintings, and sculpture. For examining diasporic histories using a wealth of disparate materials to Im imagine more egalitarian narratives, for reframing visual references of the past that raise questions about our communal stories, and for the honor she has brought to the Cooper Union. The 
The presidential citation in engineering goes to John Manick, a 1969 graduate in chemical engineering. For contributions to the field of chemical engineering as founder of Tecmer PM, a major producer of colors and additives for the plastics and fiber industries. For designing polymers to produce plastic colorants and additives using a highly innovative and collaborative approach. And for the honor he has brought to the Cooper Union. One of the great college and university traditions is the awarding of the honorary doctorate at Comacter. This is the highest honor that can be, can be bestowed by an institution of higher education. It signifies a lifetime of exceptional professional achievement and singles out individuals who embody the ethos, commitment to social responsibility, and creative spirit that reflect the institution's mission. This year, we are proud to award the Honorary Doctorate in Humane Letters to Dr. Jelani Cobb. <laughs> Dr. Cobb is known to most of you as a New Yorker staff writer, where his articles wrestle with varied subjects highly pertinent to today's cultural conversations policing, filmmaking, comedy, and electoral politics, to name just a few. Whatever the particular subject, Dr. Cobb is fearless when it comes to unpacking their common themes, which often involve the complexities of race, politics, and culture, where they intersect and sometimes collide. A recipient of fellowships from the Fulbright and Ford Foundations, he was the 2015 winner of the Sidney Hillman Award for Opinion Analysis Journalism for him, his columns on race, the police, and injustice. His books and essay collections include The Substance of Hope, Barack Obama, and the Paradox of Progress, To the Break of Dawn, a freestyle on the hip-hop aesthetic and the, devil and, Dave, and, and the Devil and Dave Chappelle and other essays. More recently, he co-edited an anthology of writing about race from The New Yorker entitled The Matter of Black Lives. What some of you may not know is that Dr. Cobb is also an accomplished historian. He earned his bachelor's at Howard University and his doctorate in American history at Rutgers. He taught history at the University of Connecticut, where he was also the director of the Institute for African American Studies. Currently, he is the Ira A. Lippmann Professor of Journalism at Columbia University's Journalism School and the director of the Ira A. Lippmann Center for Journalism and Civil and Human Rights. And it is my great pleasure to add that earlier this month, he was named Dean of Columbia's Journalism School. It is truly my honor to welcome him to the Great Hall stage. Will Dr. Hobb, Dr. Cobb and Chair of the Board of Trustees Malcolm King please come forward. <laughs> Jelani Cobb, with the approval, the approval of the trustees of the Cooper Union for the advancement of science and art, and by virtue of the authority vested in me by the state of New York, I am pleased and honored to confer upon you the degree of Doctor of Humane Letters honoris causa and admit you to all of the rights and privileges pertaining thereunto. We now invest you with the hood signifying this degree. Congratulations. And now it is my honor to present our commencement speaker, Dr. Jelani Cobb. Thank you. I'm, I'm honored and humbled, uh, President Sparks. <clears throat> Good morning to you, graduating class of 2022. Good morning to President Sparks, distinguished guests, faculty, family members, 
As all good commencement speakers know, this event is only partially about the graduating class. And in that regard, I would like for us to take a moment to acknowledge the family members and loved ones who are with us here today and who have, and who have graduated. I will also tell you that since I'm a professor, one of the first things I learned as a professor was that the less you say, the more they remember. So I will be brief. <laughs> I approach this assignment with great humility, not simply because of the honor that has been bestowed upon me by being chosen to address this commencement, but also because of the deep recognition that almost nobody actually remembers who their commencement speaker was. This is a fact, a difficult truth. I personally recall that Colin Powell, General Colin Powell, was the commencement speaker at my own graduation. But as partially due to the fact that he specifically told us not to forget who he was and went so far as to spell out his name, to help us recall who spoke that day. Since it worked for him, <laughs> it is C-O-B-B. <laughs> what I'm doing today is a little like ice sculpture. Hopefully it will hold your attention and maybe even garner a little admiration before it completely melts away. Let me begin by offering my congratulations to the class of 2022, not simply for your remarkable academic achievements, but also for the circumstances under which you did so. It was, it was our lives were placed into a rough intermission of lockdown. A new epidemiological vocabulary quickly became familiar to us as we spoke of transmission rates and viral loads and watched the grim data points of mortality tick upward. Many of you were directly affected by this new pathogen, either by suffering with it yourselves or seeing family members do so. Our modern society is defined by data, our professional careers, our retail purchases, even our love lives, are all to some degree or another mitigated by algorithms. But what exactly is the metric for grief? How do we know how difficult something is emotionally or socially? We fail at any such calculation. What we do know is that your college years have been unlike any in, in any other recent era. You've seen this vibrant city seemingly transformed into an abandoned movie set, its streets ghostly empty. The luxury of socializing, so important to the college experience, was stripped away, and instruction itself was con conducted via computer screen. I'm reminded that one definition of the word virtual is almost, or nearly as described, but not completely. And this is what these years have been like, almost, incomplete. Today also marks the second anniversary of the social storms that emerged in the aftermath of George Floyd's death, a defining moment not only in these college years, but in our society at large. Oh, I'm sorry, I got you. It took me a second, a second, a second. You have all seen a great deal. And all these things have tested your resilience. We understand resilience to be the capacity to recover quickly from difficulty, tenacity. Resilience is the durability that sustains us in difficult times, allowing us to navigate life, to navigate life despite the tempests swirling around us. We have increasingly come to recognize the value of this quality in recent years. Resilience theory in psychology holds that the nature of adversity in our lives is not nearly as important as one's capacity to adapt in the face of it. 
In the past decade, a crop of books bearing the word resilience in the title have sprung up, offering us the tough but sage path toward more fulfilling lives. Resilience, or grit as we sometimes call it, has become a mainstay in educational circles. My New Yorker colleague Maria Konnikova has written of the work of Norman Garmenzi, the developmental psychologist whose work centered around children who, despite severe adversity, are able to succeed. He relayed the story of a boy who, raised in desperate poverty by parents beholden to substance abuse, <clears throat> would arrive at school each day with what he called a bread sandwich, two slices of bread with nothing in between, a hallmark of the dearth of sustenance, physical or emotional, in his household. Yet the child unfailingly presented as cheerful and well-adapted. A small number of people, when exposed to great difficulty, simply become better at operating amidst great difficulty. There is a particular value to this line of thinking. One hallmark of adulthood is the understanding of how little we control about the world around us. We float on a sea of random probabilities, having no ability to predict or choreograph what will happen five minutes from now, much less in the larger scheme of our lives. A society may simply be a group of people bound by a pledge to navigate a common, unpredictable, and chaotic world together. If we cannot control our circumstances, we must better control ourselves. I understand this personally. Looking out at the faces of today's graduating class, I recall my own college graduation many years ago in a historical era known as the 90s. For reasons that are too complicated to explain right now, I am likely the only person you will ever meet who has a PhD, a master's, and a bachelor's in that order. <laughs> I'll tell you all about that later. But the first part of that story is pertinent. I'm the son of a third grade educated father and a high school educated mother who were the, who were the of the segregated school systems of Georgia and Alabama. My origin story as a writer involves an incident during my first week of college when my English professor assigned, professor assigned an agnostic essay, a writing assignment whose purpose was to determine how well you handled writing assignments. As I sat surrounded by students who I suspected were all more, ta all more talented and better educated than I, a feeling of panic settled over me. I passed the entire class period without writing a single word and left the room convinced that I did not belong in college. The professor who noted the blank sheet of paper I turned in at the end of class pulled me aside and told me to stop by his office the following day. Under more forgiving circumstances, I wrote the initial essay. He graded it with a furrowed brow, and then after what seemed to be an interminable wait, he marked a red B at the top of the page. I was convinced that this grade was such an act of charity that he should have been able to deduct it on his taxes. I have since given out a few deductible grades, I know this. <laughs> but it gave me the momentary morale boost that allowed me to continue in the class. We were assigned one writing assignment each week, and the following week's assignment earned an A grade. And in the 14 remaining weeks, I received 14 consecutive A's. At the end of that term, I remember calling my mother and saying, I think I'm going to be a writer. Years later, she told me what she heard when I said those words were, was, I think I'm going to be broke. <laughs> but to her credit, she encouraged my ambition, and I had gained my first lesson in endurance. Had I followed my urge to quit during that first week, I might literally have never learned what I was capable of. That was not the last time I needed to recall that lesson. It took me seven years to complete my undergraduate studies, 
because I went to school only when I had the money to pay for classes. After that, it took years more to pay the outstanding debts that would allow the university to finally grant me my degree. In my fallow periods, I worked in bookstores, read voraciously, wrote bad poetry, and tried everything I knew to retain some proximity to the intellectual life I hoped to lead. I probably took the lines from William Ernest Henley's poem Invictus, I am the captain of the, my fate, I am the master of my soul, far too seriously. But what I took from this complicated, colorful, and character-building set of circumstances was that I had achieved some degree of resilience. I suppose it would be easy, convenient, and even expected for a commencement speaker to mine his own life experiences, literature, and a dash of pop psychology for inspirational examples as you head out the doors of this great institution and into your lives. But I'm convinced that this would, in our current moment, be deeply wrong and dishonest. Our societal fixation on resilience has left us ill-equipped to ask why we have created a world, such a world, excuse me, our societal fixation on resilience has left us ill-equipped to ask why we have created a world in which such traits, such traits are necessary. Why we praise those who survive adversity rather than questioning how we have come to pass to possess such vast quantities of adversity in the first place. The appropriate term for this misplaced, misplaced, misplaced cowardice. Do we really want a world where we praise children who find a way to cheerfully go hungry? Another version of the narrative I delivered at the top of the speech marks that we are at what we hope is the tail end of a pandemic that was enabled and facilitated by decisions we made or refused to make by the disorganized thinking that hails selfishness as a virtue and the calcified inequalities that left many, most predictably the poor, in the line of epidemiological fire. For young people, the world sometimes appears like a roadmap of the failures of previous generations. Our contradictions are most readily seen through fresh eyes. But one virtue of the moment we currently inhabit is that our shortcomings are apparent even to the most jaded among us. We are gathered here today to celebrate your achievements and encourage you in your boldest endeavors. But we do so with an emotional split screen, bereaved by the incalculable loss of 19 children and two adults at Robb Elementary School in Uvalde, Texas. This new insult occurs a week and a half after 10 adults were killed in a Topps supermarket in Buffalo, New York. Have we as a society become resilient in the face of such catastrophe? Resilient in the sense that we have adapted, found ways to continue the, tra the trajectory of our lives, to recognize that such abominable grief is apparently our lot and to continue, perhaps stoically, into the future. And is such resilience a virtue? In my original version of today's comments, I plan to talk to you about the bait and switch implicit in these kinds of ceremonies. Anytime someone gives you a ceremony, I wrote, they are about to ask you to do something difficult. It's true, think about it. Birthday party is a jovial punctuation of life, but each succeeding year greets you with higher expectations bigger demands, and an increasing portion of adulthood's responsibilities. Weddings are the great occasions to celebrate the bonds of love and matrimony, but marriage is difficult and requires that each person summon their, rever their reserves of maturity and selflessness, selflessness if it is to endure. Funerals are not difficult for the deceased, but in those occasions, the burden of difficulty is passed along to those who are left to grieve them. And so it is with graduations. I was here to humorously warn you that you were being set up. The, the world will pass through these doors. The Cooper Union will expect more of you, mostly in the form of alumni contributions, <laughs> once you pass through these doors. And with those things in mind, 
I was to offer you my partial draft of advice on meeting these new expectations. They seem anodyne and insufficient in this moment, but for the sake of disclosure, my suggestions were as follows. One, believe in yourself. This may seem simple, but it requires great discipline to, and resolve to hold faith in your own abilities, especially in, in environments where doubters surround you. It has been my observation that, uh, um, excuse me, it has been my observation that actual imposters never suffer from imposter syndrome. In fact, they are often buoyed by a preternatural sense of their own abilities despite all evidence to the contrary. If you worry whether you're good enough, it is likely a sign that you have a sense of humility and a wise person's recognition of the weight of new responsibilities. One of my favorite anecdotes involves an eighth grade classmate. Our school requires our school requires our type order before being dismissed. I grew up in Queens, for the record. Our school required us to line up in height order before being dismissed. The last three, three students were myself, my classmate James, who was just a shade taller than I, and my classmate Anthony, who wound up being about 6'8". One day online, James handed me a piece of paper with his name on it. What's this, I asked. That's my autograph, he told me. You should keep it because I'm gonna be real famous one day. I made a show of crumpling the sheet in front of him and tossing it into the trash. He said, Cool J, because he had not yet started calling himself LL Cool J. <laughs> There's something to be said for being in your own corner. Two. Learn to ignore compliments. This may seem counterintuitive, but learning to ignore or at least, or at least punish compliments makes it far easier to endure insults. In today's world, particularly in our social media landscape, there is never any shortage of criticism. Much of it is mean-spirited and made in bad faith. This can be immobilizing. Indeed, that is the objective. I suggest that you pay attention to a small number of good faith observers who can be trusted to offer measured praise and considered criticism. All the rest is noise. Three, seek experience. A friend once introduced me to the concept of a life resume. He defined it as a list of experiences that may not help you get a job, but will make you a more interesting person. My own life resume includes spending a semester in Moscow watching the sun rise over the Nile, and once having Tim Gunn of Parsons School of Design and the television show Project Runway randomly walk past me in a building, stop, observe my rather tasteful gray pinstripe suit, lavender shirt and pattern tie combination, and say, that works. That's how I felt before continuing on his way. <laughs> My friend described this resume as a list of things you do outside of your professional life, but what I have found is that there's a reciprocal relationship between these things and the elements that cultivate a more interesting life invariably translate into making a more interesting and fulfilling career as well. And finally, be committed to something larger than yourself. I am reminded here of the late Nobel laureate Toni Morrison's dictum that the purpose of freedom is to free someone else. You have spent many years honing your talents, but if you are the sole beneficiary of those talents, you will have entirely missed the point. These are, I suppose, decent, non-controversial, vaguely useful ideas to pass along to young people but they are wholly insufficient for the times that confront us. Responsibility requires that I point the ob to the obvious, the ancient grievances that have consistently confounded our efforts to create a genuinely democratic, democratic, democratic have resurrected themselves in the present. The murders of 10 black people in Buffalo, 
were attributable to the mad philosophies that hold that, that holds that race, a debunked and foolish fiction, should prescribe who is to lead and who is to follow, who is fit and who is inadequate. In short, who this nation was built for. When Abraham Lincoln spoke in this great hall 162 years ago, the nation stood on the precipice of a great destructive war, an infernal conflict fought over this precise question of who this nation is for. Lincoln argued here that slavery was not an eternal designation decreed by the nation's founders, but rather an institution that was subject to the governance and the decisions made by the men who constituted the government. More than a century and a half later, we have not resolved these fundamental questions. In this moment, as in Lincoln's, our national trajectory and standing as a democracy are at a precipice. Perhaps the, not the same sort of conflagration that defined history between our history between 1861 and 1865, but of a slower, periodic, and nonetheless lethal sort. We should never become good at grieving children. So what I will say to you today is that our path has been paved by people who were not resilient. I want to thank my wife for that line. She said that to me this morning. She said that to, the, to me this morning as she was crying while she was reading the news from Texas. Our history has been paved by people who reached their moral credit limit and chose not to adapt to adversity, but rather to confront it. I have no right to ask this of you. I worry that I have allowed solemnity and anger and despair to impose on what should be a simple joyous occasion. But what I have offered you today is my honest understanding of the world that you were to lead sooner than you likely recognize. Toughness is its own virtue. In isolation, it may help an individual achieve. But if our world is to move any closer in the direction of survival, if our nation is to become any more humane, if we are ever to rid ourselves of the redundant curse of children and elders, the most fragile among us, extinguished by weapons of war, you will not need to bounce back from adversity. You will need to uproot it. Thank you. Dr. Cobb. And now for the moment for which for which so hard. We will confer degrees on all those who have completed the requirements for their disciplines. Dean Barry Shoup of the Albert Nurkin School of Engineering will present the candidates for baccalaureate degrees in engineering. Good morning. Will the candidates please rise? It's okay to applaud. <laughs> President Sparks, I have the honor to present to you the candidate, you the candidate, you the candidate degree in engineering for the Bachelor of Science degree in engineering who have completed all requirements for the degree within the Albert Nurkin School of Engineering. On the recommendation of the faculty of the Albert Nurkin School of Engineering, with the approval of the Board of Trustees of the Cooper Union, and by virtue of the authority vested in me by the State of New York, I hereby confer upon all qualified candidates 
the Bachelor of Engineering degree or the Bachelor of Science in Engineering degree and gladly admit you to all of the rights and privileges pertaining thereunto. Congratulations. Associate Dean Ruben Savitsky will now call all graduates to the stage to receive their diplomas, beginning with chemical engineering. Thank you, President Sparks. Will Trustee Brian Steinwurzel please come forward to greet these graduates as they receive their diplomas. We will now present diplomas to the civil engineering graduates. Folks, all right. <laughs> Let's start with chemical engineering. How's that? All right. All right, it's been a while since we've done this in person. All right. Summa Cum Laude graduate, recipient of the William C. and Esther Hoffman Beller Prize, as well as the American Institute of Chemists Student Award and the Service to the School Award from the School of Engineering, Sanjna Rao. recipient of the New York American Chemical Society Excellence in Chemistry Award, as well as the Marshall Raffel Prize in Thermodynamics, Ibrahim Abushark. <laughs> Magna Cum Laude graduate and recipient of the Marshall Raffel Prize in Thermodynamics, Joanna Zhou. Peter Baccarella. <laughs> Recipient of the Robert Spice Fund Prize, Jonathan Dorotheos. Zirai <laughs> Zhang. Juan Park. <laughs> Cum laude graduate, Catherine Chen. <laughs> Magna Cum laude graduate, recipient of the Howard M. Siegel Memorial Prize, as well as the Elmer J. Baden Chemistry Award, Angela Huang. Cum laude graduate, Christopher Chan. <laughs> Cum laude graduate, Wal E. Khan. <laughs> Magna Cum laude graduate, Purna Dutta. Cum laude graduate, Joseph Lee Liu. <laughs> Alexandros Pablo. <laughs> Ivan Lin. Jessica Chu. <laughs> Semi Sun. <laughs> e 
Emily Hannah Gasharpour. Cum laude graduate, Sun Hung Zhao. Cum laude graduate, recipient of the Louis Gleekman Memorial Prize, as well as the Charles Goodman Essay Award in Humanities, Tiffany Chung. Marissa Lorenz. Congratulations to all the chemical engineering graduates. All right. Now we will present diplomas to the civil engineering graduates. Jeffrey Wong. Well done. Congratulations. Thank you. Edvik Julius Freya. Also receiving an HSS minor in economics and public policy, Alexander L. Cho. Syed Nakwi. <laughs> Cum laude graduate, recipient of the Joseph Kalb Fund Prize, and also receiving an HSS minor in economics and public policy, Ilias Proko. <laughs> Cum laude graduate, Shine Lee. Carla Andrea Menezes Garcia. Cum laude graduate, Vildin Kavdar. Veronica Dolega. Cum laude graduate, Erica L. Chen. Shin Yin Fan. Juan E. Falseros Pinto. Hayden F. Kodiga. Cum laude graduate, recipient of the William C. and Esther Hoffman Beller Prize, the Maxwell Linzer Prize, as well as a service to the School Award from Alumni Affairs and Development, Mary K. Bavruska. Also receiving an HSS minor in economics and public policy, La Sham Na La Sang. I hope I did that right. Yeah. Sol A. Mireles Sanchez. Now present diplomas to the electrical engineering graduates. Okay, folks, this might take a while. Summa cum laude graduate, recipient of the Al Abraham Pletman Memorial Fund Prize, the Harold Keel Fund Prize. 
the Harry W. Reddick Award, the Class of 1907 Award, the Irvin Leon Lynn Memorial Prize, the Frank L. Caldero Humanities Award, also getting an HSS minor in literature as well as a minor in mathematics, Nathaniel Jacob Kingsbury. <laughs> It's a tough act to follow, I know. <laughs> Henry Jung San. Samuel Scherzer. Summa Cum Laude graduate and recipient of the Harold Irwin Rue Prize. Andrew Scott Lorber. Evan Goldstein. Tamar S. Bakalu. Summa Cum Laude graduate and recipient of the Dale E. Zand Prize, and last minute addition, this is kind of an interesting one. So Joshua Yoon, who's coming up, worked on a project with mechanical engineering students who got an award, which I'll name in a minute. They wanted to honor Joshua as well for working on this together. So recipient of the, co-recipient of the Nicholas M. Stefano Prize, Joshua Yoon. Hadassah, did I miss something? Hadassah Y. Yanovsky. <laughs> Summa Cum Laude graduate, recipient of the William C. and Esther Hoffman Beller Prize, and also receiving an HSS minor in philosophy, history, and society, Alexa Jacob. Arthur Skoke. Danny Hong. Brian Dwan. Yue Wang. Alistair Liu. <laughs> Cum Laude graduate, Leon Jungang Fang. <laughs> Stephen Lee. <laughs> Cum Laude graduate, Amy Leong. <laughs> Magna Cum Laude graduate and recipient of the Leon Matchett's Prize, Daniel Kim. <laughs> Paul, oh my gosh, okay, I'll try. Melchiore Cucciara. Cum Laude graduate and recipient of the Eugene Ogre Memorial Award, Anthony Marino Belladonna. <laughs> Magna Cum Laude graduate and recipient of the Jesse Sherman Book Award, Todori Capuranis. <laughs> Theo Song. Donghyun Daniel Park. <laughs> Min Cheng. <laughs> 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 
I said this is okay. He couldn't be here today, but cum laude graduate Philip G. Blumen. Why not? <laughs> we started off on a good note here. OK. Uh, we will now present diplomas to the mechanical engineering graduates. Will Trustee, yes. will Trustee Lou Menzion please come forward to greet these graduates as they receive their diplomas? Julia Buckley. Congratulations. Cum laude graduate, recipient of the Mechanical Engineering Design Prize, as well as the IDC Foundation Innovation Fellowship, Kevin Dye. Justin Evan Hoey. Yeah. Summa Cum Laude graduate, recipient of the William C. and Esther Hoffman Beller Prize, the Nicholas M. Stefano Prize, and double minor in mathematics and computer science, Brandon G. Lone Ho. Also receiving a minor in computer science, Anna Raja Rao. <laughs> Summa cum laude graduate, recipient of the Nicholas M. Stefano Prize and the Wallace Chinitz Prize, as well as a minor in computer science, Jared Jacobowit. Jacobowit. Cum laude graduate, Andrew Jordan Yair Gross. Okay. Summa cum laude graduate, recipient of the William G. Hunt Class of 1905 Fund Prize, as well as an IDC Foundation Innovation Fellowship, Rafael J. Kepix. Young Jun Kim. <laughs> Sung Min Choi. <laughs> Cum laude graduate, Solby O. Oh. <laughs> Anthony Chen. Cum laude graduate, Alexander Coldy. Matthew DJ Kim. Magna Cum laude graduate, recipient of the Alexander C. Grove Memorial Prize and getting a minor in bioengineering, Gianna A. Slusher. Magna Cum Laude graduate, recipient of the Harold Irwin Rue Prize, as well as the Mechan well as the Mechan well as the Prize, Jeanette L. Searcy. Okay. We will now present, oops, try again. We will now present diplomas to the Bachelor of Science in Engineering graduates. Okay. 
receiving a minor in computer science, Dan Brody. Recipient of the Mechanical Engineering Design Prize, as well as the Benjamin Menschel Fellowship and an HSS minor in Philosophy, History, and Society, Brandon K. Bunt. Will the candidates for master's degree in engineering please rise? <laughs> President Sparks, I now have the honor to present to you candidates for the master's degree in engineering that have completed all requirements for the degree within the Maurice Canbar Institute of Graduate Studies in the Albert Nurkin School of Engineering. On the recommendation of the faculty of the Albert Nurkin School of Engineering, with the approval of the Board of Trustees of the Cooper Union, and by virtue of the authority vested in me by the State of New York, I hear, I hear upon all qualified candidates the Master of Engineering degree, and gladly admit you to all of the rights and privileges pertaining thereunto. Congratulations. All right, I guess I'm back up here. <laughs> okay, ready to roll. Receiving a master's degree in civil engineering, Amos Chung. Master's degree in civil engineering, Evan J. Strauss. I think I see a theme here. These are all civil engineers. Okay, got it. Joshua B. Pitagorsky. Okay. Master's degree in chemical engineering, Seung Woon Sally Na. Master's in Chemical Engineering, Mahir Alam. <laughs> Master's degree in Electrical Engineering, Richard S. Lee. <laughs> Master's degree in Electrical Engineering, Samuel Maltz. Master's degree in electrical engineering, Theo Jacanu. <laughs> Master's degree in electrical engineering, Jack Zhang. <laughs> Master's degree in electrical engineering, Nifi Viswanathan Subayan. Master's degree in electrical engineering, Alan Simon Levin. <laughs> Master's degree in electrical engineering, Isaac Albukai. <laughs> Master's of engineering degree in electrical engineering, Ostap Stefan Wojnarowski. Master's degree in electrical engineering, Andre A. Akhmetov. <laughs> Master's degree in electrical engineering, Jack Spencer Langner. <laughs> 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 
master's degree in civil engineering, Harsho Sanyal. Master's degree in civil engineering, Jared Lawrence Rogovin. <laughs> Master's degree in civil engineering, Aaron R. Fink. <laughs> Master's degree in civil engineering, Noah Voland Fechter. Master's degree in civil engineering, Gregory Joseph Belenitsky. <laughs> Master's of mechanical engineering, Harris Pospoletti. <laughs> Master's of mechanical engineering, Rao Ramlal. Master's in Mechanical Engineering, Oliver Zhang. <laughs> Master's in Mechanical Engineering, Nicholas Anthony Triano. <laughs> Master's in Electrical Engineering, Sarah Schnoll. I think we have a twofer. Okay. Summa cum laude graduate for his bachelor's degree in electrical engineering and also recipient of the Jesse Sherman Book Award and a dual master's degree in electrical engineering. And a little birdie told me it's her birthday today. Happy birthday! So you'll forgive me if I butcher this. Uh, Mark C. Kazakowski. Not to be outdone, receiving a bachelor's and master's degree in electrical engineering as well, and a cum laude graduate, Derek Lee. The trifecta, cum laude graduate, recipient of a bachelor's and master's degree in electrical engineering, Zi Hao Zhang. Okay, yeah, there's a lot of stuff here, All right? Let me, uh, <laughs> we're trying to figure out how to place it so I can read it all, which is, which is great. Okay, so we'll start with the, uh, with the top. Bachelor's of Engineering degree in Electrical Engineering, summa cum laude graduate, recipient of the Harold S. Goldberg Prize, the Henry D. Dickinson Award, the Jesse Sherman Book Award, and also a Master's of Engineering degree in Electrical Engineering, Jonathan Lamb. Congratulations once again to all the graduates. Dean Nadir Tarani of the Irwin S. Channon School of Architecture will now present the candidates for baccalaureate degrees in architecture. Thank you. Good afternoon. Will the candidates please rise? <laughs> President, President Sparks, uh, I now have the honor to present to you the candidates for the for the in architecture who have completed all requirements for the degree within the Irwin S. Channon School of Architecture. On the recommendation of the faculty of the Irwin S. Channon School of Architecture, with approval of the Board of Trustees of the Cooper Union, and by virtue of the authority vested in me by the State of New York, I hereby confer upon all qualified candidates 
the degree of Bachelor of Architecture and gladly admit you to all of the rights and privileges pertaining thereunto. Congratulations. <laughs> Associate Dean Haley Eber will now call graduates to the stage to receive their diplomas. Will Trustee Christina Ross please come forward? Please come forward. Please come forward as they receive their diplomas. <laughs> Magna cum laude, William Cooper MacLeese's Fellowship, and the recipient of the 2020 Diane Lewis Memorial Architecture Travel Fellowship in Search of Civic Space. Han Na Kim. <laughs> the recipients of the Tony and David Yonell Merritt Award of Excellence in Architecture, Sydney K. Hoxfield's Lynette. The recipients of the Allen N. Goldfisher Memorial Award and the Cooper Mac Thesis Fellowship, Tilok Costa. <laughs> the recipients of the George Ledley Fund Annual Prize, Hyun Min Kim. Peter Bruder Memorial Fund Annual Prize, the Martin J. Waters Memorial Award, the Cooper Mac Thesis Fellowship, the 2020 AIA Brooklyn Scholarship, the 2021 Eleanor Allworks Scholarship, the 2021 Robert, w. Robert Leslie Award from the SOM Foundation, as well as the Service Award from the, from the Sanjana Lahiri. Recipients of the Snow Architecture Commencement Prize, the Benjamin Menschel Fellowship, the IDC Innovation Fellowship, the 2021 Diane Lewis Memorial Architecture Travel Fellowship in Search of Civic Space, and the William Cooper Mac Thesis Fellowship, Azin Nam. <laughs> Recipients of the Tony David Yonell Merritt Award of Excellence in Architecture, the Benjamin Menschel Fellowship, the RDC Foundation Innovative Fellowship, the 2021 Diane Lewis Memorial Architectural Architectural in Search of Civic Space, as well as the Service to the School Award from the School of Architecture, Annabella Grace Chen. <laughs> Recipients of the George Ledley Fund Annual Prize, as well as the Cooper Mac Thesis Fellowship, Janmin Chung. The recipient of the Alpha Rho Time Medal, Tiam Shaper. The recipients of the William Cooper Mac Thesis Fellowship, Maria Eleni Komninu. <laughs> recipients of an HSS minor in art history, Amanda Cheng. <laughs> the recipients of the William Cooper Mac Thesis Fellowship, Kai Kwong. <laughs> and Bo Kai is back. Yes. <laughs> hey, Bo. The 
recipient of the Abraham E. Kazan Award for Urban Design, as well as the Cooper Mac Thesis Fellowship, Harrison Moser. Suet Y O. Chang Yi Fan. Will the candidates for the Master of Science in Architecture degree please rise? <laughs> President Sparks, uh, I now have the honor to present to you the candidates for the Master of Science in Architecture degree who have completed all requirements within the Irwin S. Channon School of Architecture. On the recommendation of the faculty of the Irwin S. Channon School of Architecture, with the approval of the Board of Trustees of the Cooper Union, and by virtue of the authority vested in me by the State of New York, I hereby confer upon all qualified candidates the degree of Master of Science in Architecture, and gladly admit you to all of the rights and privileges pertaining thereunto. Congratulations. Your way, Liu. <laughs> Tao He. <laughs> Zifei Zhen. <laughs> si Yi Chen. Sophie Krauss. <laughs> Vivos Yerales. Dean Mike Essel of the School of Art will present the candidates for baccalaureate degrees in fine arts. Will the candidates please rise? President Sparks, I now have the honor to present to you the candidates for the baccalaureate degree in fine arts who have completed all their respective requirements within the School of Art. On the recommendation of the faculty of the School of Art with the approval of the Board of Trustees of the Cooper Union and by virtue of the authority vested in me by the State of New York, I hereby confer upon all qualified candidates the degree of Bachelor of Fine Arts, and gladly admit you to all of the rights and privileges pertaining thereunto. Congratulations.
Associate Dean Adriana Farmiga will now call graduates to the stage to receive their diplomas. Will student trustee Adriana Gomez please come forward to greet these graduates. <laughs> recipient of the Sarah Cooper Hewitt Fund Prize and recipient of the Service to the School Award from the School of Art, Yeji Kim. Alex Klutchman. Wade Winslow. River Melcher. Recipient of the Benjamin Menschel Fellowship and recipient of the Irma Gustino Weiss, no Weiss, no Weiss Fund, Virginia Raboli. <laughs> recipient of the Type Directors Club Scholarship, Anna Valeria Castillos Atias. Recipient of the Eleanor Gay Lee Gallery Foundation Scholar Award, Benjamin Menschel Fellowship, Irma Gustino Weiss Study Abroad Endowment Fund, and the O'Brien Fellowship for Study Abroad, Angelica Berestko. <laughs> Yumi Rodriguez. Maya Van Bale. <laughs> Recipient of the Elizabeth Foundation for the Arts Robert Blackburn Printmaking Award, Dane Cohen. Recipient of the Ethel Cram Memorial Prize and the Karen Tendler Lurkis Prize, Anthony De Batista. <laughs> Recipient of the Michael S. Bevo Memorial Prize and the Raymond G. Brown Memorial Prize, Kaylee Weaver. Recipient of the Vincent J. Milarchik Jr. Memorial Prize, Isabella Fernandez. Recipient of the Medici Award, Christopher McCready. Recipient of the Eleanor Gay Lee Gallery Foundation Scholar Award, Scholar Award, Scholar Award. <laughs> Recipient of the Betty Golden Memorial Fund Book Prize and the Vincent J. Malarchik Jr. Memorial Prize, Fareed Latore. Karen Tendler Lurkis Prize, Samantha Siegel. <laughs> Sean Pearl. <laughs> Charles Newell Jacobson.
recipient of the Richard Lewis Block Memorial Prize, Jane Thompson. 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 Recipient of the Fian of the Fian Earl Humanities Award, Zachary Thompson. Recipient of the Michael S. Vivo Memorial Prize, Maura Orcana. Craig Stevens. River Friedman. Benjamin Blaustein. Ava Sodergren. Recipient of the Laura Miller Margolius Memorial Prize, Alec Rasmussen. Michael Contrastano. Recipient of the Rolf Harum Paint Award, Anna Lucia Turquinio. Recipient of the Medici Award and the Karen Tendler Lurkis Prize, Devon Avadikian Coley. Aishwin Wang. Recipient of the Rolf Harum Paint Award, Julian Chen. Recipient of the Jacques and Natasha Gelman Foundation Prize and the Sylvia Appleman Award, Wildriana Maria de Jesus Paulino. Harper Thomas Paradowski. Anjanasari Sudiman. Kayla Leon Chambers. Recipient of the Michael S. Vivo Memorial Prize, Laura Di Pasquale. Recipient of the Pietro and Alfreda Montana Prize and the Prize and the Prize Fellowship, Bennett Koziak. Fiona Dowling. Recipient of the Sarah Cooper Hewitt Fund Prize, Paris Phillips. Recipient of the Pietro and Alfreda Montana Prize, Patricia Suslow. Recipient of the Medici Award, Annabelle Boardman. Recipient of the Yarnell Merritt Award of Excellence in Art, Service to the School Award, the Martin J. Waters Memorial Award, and the Vin Vincent J. Milarchik Jr. Memorial Prize, Izzy Jerome. <laughs> Alma Mus Nunez.
recipient of the Irma Gustino Weiss Prize, and the girl with the most cake, Chloe Friend. Austin Taylor Fickle. Recipient of the James Craig and Irene Scala Designing with Type Award, Isaac Leahy Lowe. Recipient of the Rhoda Lubalin Fellowship, Cora Anderson Bicknell. Recipient of the Rothenberg Fellowship and the O'Brien Fellowship for Study Abroad, Ricky Vargas. Recipient of the A.A. Lowe Fund Prize and the Benjamin Menchel Fellowship, Kanis Fatima. Recipient of the Henry Dropkin Award Fund Prize and the Rhoda Lubalin Fellowship, Richard Yearwich. <laughs> Madeline Almonte. Recipient of the Fred A. Lane Prize, Moray McDonald. Recipient of the Elliot Lash Memorial Prize, Matthew Lee. Paula Solis. Recipient of the Robert Beer Greer Film Award, Maya Dixon. <laughs> Stephanie Olgin. <laughs> Oluwesheni Akinyemi. Zoe Bohe. Recipient of the Michael S. Vivo Memorial Prize and the Benjamin Menchel Fellowship, Talia Krupnik. Wilson and Boone Miller. of the Elliot Lash Memorial Prize, Mia Bella Shulman. graduates one final round of applause.
like to welcome the president of the Cooper Union Alumni Association, Robert Tan, to the stage. Good afternoon. Congratulations. And uh, as I was watching the processions and, and, and stuff, I have to say, I'm saying to myself, what a really good looking graduating class there is, okay? Of this century, because the really good looking graduating class was my year last century. And I wanna to say to the parents and friends, you don't look so shabby yourself, okay? One of the things that I took away uh, this morning was the rights and privileges of being a Cooper Union graduate. One of the rights is that you are no longer students, 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 but alumni of the Cooper Union, and that is a lifelong membership. The second, the second items that I wanted to talk about was privilege, and I want to thank Dr. Cobb for giving us the first privilege, and that is alumni donations. <laughs> and, and I am also humbled and heartened uh, by the red squares that many of you are wearing on your robes today. I understand they represent a commitment to our school going back to full tuition scholarship, and I applaud you. <laughs> I was the alumni trustee and chair of the FEC committee to bring the plan to fruition with the help of Dr. S of, of Dr. President Sparks. Um, so the donations help in offsetting the budget, and that means that we are allowed to give more scholarship, and we're well on our way to uh, to doing the plan, or in our plan. The second thing is, in terms of privilege, is that the board of trustees are made up of alumni trustees. One third of the trustees are elected from the alumni. And the other aspects of it is that there are two student trustees, which is really important to understand, understand, understand the trustees respect and understand what you bring to the school. So the elections are really important. So I hope that you, that you on the Alumni Association website, your email, so that next year, when we do our elections for the next alumni trustee, that you will be voting for who you think would help the school. So with that, I say congratulations, and um, last one, one last thing, the CUAA has a gift for you, so make sure you pick it up uh, in your respective rooms, okay? Thank you, and congratulations. Thank you, Robert. Before we conclude the 162nd commencement exercises, I would like to thank the deans, faculty, staff, and students for mounting an excellent end of year show in the foundation building and in 41 and in 41. And in, please do take time to view the exhibition. Uh, please also join us for a reception immediately following commencement. The reception will be in the park outside of this building. Um, I ask that the audience please remain seated until the recessional has concluded. Platform party and graduates, please rise. <laughs>